That's not good. Only one person uh, told me that he had a COVID, so I said he can be on the Zoom. I am. Uh, um, Ganesh, I, I will be uh, starting on September 30. I will be in person, but uh, given that I'm going to a cataract surgery in a few days, I decided that because of the surgery, where the dates are not many dates are available, and they ask you all sorts of questions. And if you fail on one of those questions, then it's they postpone the surgery. No, no, I understand all that. But why are the yeah. questions not coming? No, the thing is that uh, once we go uh, in person, I'm not going to do hybrid anymore. Oh, they are not even online. These students they are missing online also. Well, then I'm going to take an attendance, uh, and that's what I'm going to do. Uh, uh, Nita, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Yeah, uh, Nita, please take the attendance of the students that you have in our list. Will do. Suresh, do you know who has covered the, the student? Uh, uh, Rashula. Rashula. Yeah. Okay. I, I, no, I don't know whether he has a COVID or not. He, what the information was that his roommate had a COVID. Oh, okay. And he tested uh, a negative, but he is also not. Uh, he will test it again, and then I don't know exactly. I basically told him he doesn't have to come. He can just be on the Zoom. So is Rasulov on the Zoom already? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, so he's there. Are you okay? Uh, yeah, I have very mild symptoms, but I'm okay. Did you do a home test? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did that, yeah. And it was positive or negative, you don't have to tell me. If you are but if you are able to say, you can tell. It was negative. Okay, okay good. Do you want to start? Sure. So, Suresh, I can start? Yeah, but uh, Nita is taking attendance, though. Yeah, I think we are ready. Oh, okay. Okay, and Nita, please send a note to people that that we will be taking attendance, and, and that will... That will uh, uh, this is a pass fail course, but if you don't come in often enough, I'll fail you. <laughs> I, will, I will send uh, the note. Yeah, well, you don't have to add the last line. I will do that <laughs> in the class. <laughs> okay, Guiva, you're on. Uh, uh, let me just mention a few things. Uh, we are, um, when the time and the dates are available, we are asking the faculty at our school to, to give their song and dance and whatever they are doing. Uh, so the students get to know what they're doing. Um, also, um, um, we are also asking the students that when they present, first year and second year students, when they present the, the, the papers at the end of the end of the end of this class, which will be end of the spring, uh, they will be choosing papers from our faculty. So it'll be good to know what everybody is doing so that you get to know uh, their research and also uh, able to choose uh, what you would present at the end of the year, okay? So that's kind of the, the idea here. And I will let Guiva take the floor now and, 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 and we can listen. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for coming over here. And uh, for those who don't know me, uh, I'm Gui Huaman at the OEM Group. And I was uh, born in China, then I moved to Singapore for my uh, study. I did my undergraduate at the National University of Singapore. Then I did my master at Jaffa Tech. Then after that, I went back to Singapore and worked at uh, United Parcel Service for around four years before my, uh, before my PhD at Michigan. So I joined uh, UTD in 2019, so this is my fourth year here. Okay, so this work is about telehealth expansion during the COVID-19 period, and it's a joint work with uh, Su Jin Shun, and uh, she is actually from our IS group, and uh, she is an expert in telehealth and uh, an excellent collaborator, and uh, she couldn't be here today uh, because she just delivered a newborn baby earlier this day. Yesterday. Yesterday, yes. Yesterday. 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 Yes. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, 
Before diving into today's talk, I will follow Suresh's suggestion by uh, spending some time to talk about my other papers to provide an overview of my research so our students will know what I have been doing. Okay, so as you know, uh, my research primarily focused on uh, personalized healthcare using heterogeneous treatment effect analysis. By saying heterogeneous treatment effect, I mean the same treatment can have different effects for different people, right? So think about a uh, vaccine. So the vaccine may be more effective for some people, but less effective for others, right? Even when you have two treatments, say Pfizer and Moderna, it may be possible that some people will benefit more from Pfizer and other people may benefit more from Moderna. And of course, when you know the treatment effect for different people, then you can match patients with the treatments to improve the outcomes. So this is essentially a personalized care because you are going to personalize the treatments for different people. By using observational data for heterogeneous treatment effect analysis prevents two major challenges. The first challenge is endogeneity issues because treatments are not randomly assigned to different people. So you face endogeneity issues. And then the second challenge is high dimensionality because you may not have enough data to compare different treatments for a given patient. Okay, so actually my first paper address is these two challenges by developing a new causal machine learning technique that combines instrument variable from econometrics with a uh, corner forest in the machine learning literature. Okay, so this is my uh, instrument variable method. So this method can analyze the treatment effects for different people such that we can match patients with care. And uh, uh, earlier this week, I was uh, very happy to know that this was named a finalist for the PI Scala Best Paper Award. So this is like the best award for uh, healthcare operations. Thank you for that. Is that course, going to be determined in Indianapolis? It, yeah, it will be determined at the coming informs conference, I guess. Okay, okay, but well, you'll probably know even before that, but you will be, you will be probably uh, presenting that it. Yeah, I will uh, that. Yeah. yes, I will present over there uh, at the coming informs conference. And also, uh, uh, by the way, thanks for Erica for inviting me to his PhD seminar to talk about this paper as well. And uh, as you know, this paper is very well cited. And uh, also, uh, we managed to get a 1 million grant together with the University of Pennsylvania Medical School to implement this method uh, to improve post-acute care better for the veterans. Again, so this is uh, about the first paper over here. And then the second paper uh, essentially applies this method to compare different hospitals for different patients. So the main motivation for the second research is really the existing hospital quality information are based on population average information. So for example, if you search US News, you get the ranking of hospitals. I bet if you search US News again, you'll get the same ranking. But in reality, the best hospital for you may be different from those for you, right? So this paper compares different hospitals, uh, 35 New York hospitals as an example, Indeed, they find the best hospitals could be different for different patients. Okay, by doing so, we actually help uh, patients match or find the appropriate providers. And then the third paper over here actually uh, compares the two scenarios to analyze the potential value of so-called personalized information or personalized ranking. So we compare two scenarios. Scenario number one, I give you average information, the same for everyone, right? But at the same time, I'm going to increase the capacity. Okay, average information with additional capacity. Second scenario is that I'm going to have the same capacity, but I'm going to provide you more personalized information to see, you know, how well they are compared with each other. And we find that by providing patient-specific information actually is comparable to those achievable by allowing the best providers to treat 10 to 20 percent additional uh, patients for additional capacity increase. So this one highlights the potential value 
of patient centric information or the personalized healthcare information. And this paper is essentially uh, talking more about big data and precision medicine. It highlights the challenges and opportunities in this area. So this is uh, my stream of research in uh, personalized healthcare. And I have another stream of research that looks at how to improve healthcare efficiency. Okay, so for example, the first paper, which is a joint work with uh, Ron Ho Zheng. Okay, Ron Ho Zheng is actually uh, from UT Austin, a comic group. Okay, they actually had a background from CMU in operations management. I don't know how he managed to find a job in accounting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Tim Long De uh, is a faculty at Johns Hopkins. And uh, for this paper, we study the effect of direct flights on the sharing of organs across different states. Okay, as you can see, uh, organ transportation is a very time sensitive business. So intuitively, if you have a direct flight, you know, then surgeons are more likely to share the organs, they are more likely to accept organs. So indeed, this is uh, confirmed by our study. And this one, I think earlier this year, it was named as the uh, runner up for the responsible business education by Financial Times. Uh, for this research. And also it's mentioned by uh, Alvin Ross. I, I, I bet many of you know Alvin Ross, and who is also uh, conducting a related field study with his students. And also uh, it has drawn lots of media attention by lots of uh, uh, media, which I'm not going to name them uh, in details. Okay, so the, the sixth paper is a solo author paper uh, where I study the effect of Medicaid expansion on waiting time in the emergency department. Okay, so for Medicaid expansion, it actually has been studied by many people, but uh, actually no one has looked at the impact on waiting time, probably due to a lack of data, I guess. Uh, but the effect actually is not very obvious. Some people say we'll reduce the waiting time in the ED because once you have insurance, you don't need to go to ED. You can just see your primary care physician, right? So the waiting time in the ED will reduce. But other people may say, oh, you know, we may increase the ED waiting time because once people have insurance, then they are more likely to seek health care, right? They're, they are more likely to, you know, to, to visit the hospitals. So this is my paper. I uh, look at the impact of the expansion of waiting time. Okay, I long, not only look at this, but I also developed an, another new course of machine learning technique that incorporates first the difference approach in econometrics into a course of forest in the machine learning literature. And this one allows me to understand the heterogeneous effect of the expansion on different hospitals. So I find that the effect is actually much larger for large tissue hospitals. Okay, so the results are very useful to both patients and hospitals. So think about a state that wants to expand Medicaid. Then the hospital managers will know, you know, what kind of impact will it have on my hospital? Okay, so that's the, uh, the sixth item over here. And for the famous item, this is a, a joint work with my good friend, Bakuth, and uh, he just joined University of Oregon, okay, as an assistant professor. Uh, this one, we are looking at uh, the volume effect. Okay, basically, volume effect is well documented in the healthcare literature. The more you do, yeah, the better you are, right? In terms of, of you know, either the outcome or the duration of the surgery. However, one thing that hasn't been looked at the literature is that the volume effect can be different for different patients, right? So think about a very easy case. No matter whether it's a young surgeon or it's an older surgeon, probably would take a similar amount of time because it's easy to do, right? But then there are other cases, it's probably better to be done by uh, high volume surgeons because you know the effect can be heterogeneous. So what we did in this study is to analyze the heterogeneous effect of volume across different types of patients. Okay, so indeed we see that you know. The difference between high volume and the low volume surgeons, the effect in terms of uh, in terms of the uh, surgical volume on surgery duration 
is heterogeneous across different patients. And this readout is very useful for hospitals because you know the operating room cost is actually very high. So if I know, you know, what kind of patients can be better treated by what kind of surgeons, then I can better match that in order to reduce my operating room time to save the cost for the hospitals. Okay, so as you can see over here, I use surgical volume as my treatment. Okay, so the treatment in itself is no longer medical treatment. It can be many other things. Okay, over here I use surgical volume as my empirical treatment. Okay. And if you think about this surgical volume as only one treatment, then the eighth item over here is a joint work with Mimi, who is here. And the Wally Hop at Michigan, Mike is uh, an anesthesiologist at uh, Michigan Medicine. Okay. So this slide, we look at multiple treatment. Okay. If surgical volume is only one treatment, but if we look at team familiarity, suppose a team has three members and the other two. Surgery and nurse. If you look at pairwise familiarity, we have three different treatments, right? Three different treatments. So which one is more important among the three of the treatments is one open question. And even if you look at the three treatments across different patients, the effect could be different across different patients as well. So this paper kinds of consider multiple treatments which are the team familiarities in this context, uh, we analyze the heterogeneous effects of the team familiarity across different patients. Of course, we also need to develop a new technique because the existing study can only accommodate one treatment. But over here, we have multiple treatments. So Mimi developed a new technique that combines multiple regression model with a machine learning model to analyze such a heterogeneous treatment effects. So you can see that these two papers are actually quite closely related and it can help hospitals to better assign teams, not only surgeons, but a team to different patients in order to improve operational efficiency. So any questions so far? If I move to the next slide. Quick group, I do have a question about the first stream that you had about the personalized care healthcare. Uh, it, it is a question that is they probably beyond the scope of what you do, but I'm just curious when you do this personalized healthcare, how you address like fairness or privacy issue because you personalize right based on based on the patient's characteristics and you give them different treatment. Will in practice will there be an issue in terms of ethical or things like this? I like that question because it has been asked many times by reviewers. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a great question. So in some of the cases, I can give you one case. There may be some issues. So for example, uh, one of my projects is looking at the heterogeneous effect of ventilator uh, on the survival of COVID patients. Right. So think about this way. A very healthy patient, even with COVID, no need ventilator, right? Effect is zero. Think about another dying patient, no need ventilator, right? because it's going to die anyway. So the effect will be heterogeneous. But of course, there will be ethical issue, right? They will say, why not give me the ventilator even I'm dying, <laughs> right? So this one will have some ethical issue, I agree. Uh, so I'm not going to you know, dive deeper into that. But in many other cases, there probably isn't so much ethical issue. So for example, if I tell you, Su Chen, you are more suitable for Pfizer vaccine, but everybody is more suitable for Moderna vaccine. I give you this information, but as I still give you the option which one to choose. So if there is an ethical issue, then that's due to yourself because you make the choice. We only provide information. Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay, very good. Any other questions before I... On the personalized healthcare, do they ever think about the person's financial conditions? Uh, financial, what financial publicities? Financial. Yeah, because because um, um, that may have some implication on what kind of treatment uh, they can afford and what kind of treatment the doctors would give to them. That kind of. Yeah. I mean, you talk about ethical issues, so you know, Mr. Trump got a very good care when he got COVID. 
Yeah, that, that's a great question. So, so I would say over here, if you look at medical cam, medical audit cam, that's one dimension. And then another dimension as search mission could be financial perspective, right? So then essentially over here, we are providing personalized information from the auto cam perspective. You can also provide uh, the information from the financial perspective. So what we are doing over here is to provide more personalized information in order to make a better decisions. Okay, so suppose the health uh, the, the finance information is given over there, and now suppose I'm going to give you information. One of them is personalized, the other one is population average. So I bet our personalized information will help you make a better decisions given the financial information you have. So, so I guess maybe the next question is more like when you say personalized, you personalize according to just their medical characteristics, or you also take into consideration of social economic information about each individual. So for my research, I primarily focus on uh, either medical outcome or operation efficiency. But of course, uh, I mean, my Y variable can be many other things. It can be financial. So for example, I can easily apply my technique to the marketing kind of study. Say, you know, uh, if I do a marketing campaign, what kind of customers will be more likely to be influenced by my, my marketing campaign? Then I can give you personalized advertisements. But then the Y variable over here will be more like a sales. So I give you uh, uh, the reason I ask you is uh, that you know recently I'm I'm going to the cataract surgery, and one of the method for so apart from choosing the lens and everything, there's also a question of using the laser for surgery or using the traditional method. And the right now the laser surgery is cost like six hundred dollar per eye, and I have one one colleague in in my neighborhood who decided not to go for that and go for a traditional surgery. But when I talked to the surgeon when I was there in the hospital for the, my first eye, I tried to find out what is the difference between the two and, and, and whatever. And I read some articles about it and I, I could only find out that the studies basically told me that they were trying to look at the veterans, insurance for veterans, and they decided that the, the laser treatment is not cost effective. That by that I mean, if you put the cost into the factor, the benefits do not outweigh the cost. But then there are people who says, okay, if there's an epsilon amount of benefit, I don't care about the cost. I will take the epsilon benefit because it's after all a question of I and it's one time in your life. Uh, you will take the epsilon benefit uh, for whatever cost it gives you. So there are these issues about. So when I, finally the doctor told me, if insurance covered med insurance covered laser surgery, which they don't, then she will do laser surgery to everyone. Yeah. And so I told them, you know, I'm going for laser regardless. But that was uh, that particular statement from her basically told me that laser surgery has benefits. If the insurance pays for it, she will do it for everybody. Yeah, but if they don't pay, then, you know, people are choosing to do traditional surgery as well, which is, which then they save $600 per eye. So I think financial considerations can be quite important. I mean, the question about dying and then and, and, and don't need any treatment, there may be not as many, but financial is applying to every patient. Yes. It's a significant yes. portion of the, so it is a more common, more interesting question than the, 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 the other question, which is almost given, you know, if you're one day before you die, there's no, no reason to give any treatment to you. That's what sort of, it's a no, no brainer in some sense, you know. Yeah, actually, that's a very good point. It actually highlights the importance of uh, personalized healthcare. So let me kind of explain a little bit more uh, about the information you have. I mean, the scenario you just mentioned. So just now you were talking about, you know, the cost, right? Mm -hmm. I have my quality, I have my cost. Then, so actually, for this paper, we actually consider many other things beside quality. So for example, we consider waiting time, travel distance. So you can think about uh, waiting time 
like a, another cost similar to you know financial cost and etc. So what we do in this paper is that we are not simply assign everyone to the best hospital. So what we do is to give you a refined information. Okay, one uh, personalized information. The other one is average information. Of course, everyone will want to go to the best hospital, but if everyone do that, then you will have a long waiting time, right? So what do we do is that we do a simulation, okay? So each time I'm going to provide information, you also observe the waiting time at that particular provider. You make your decision, okay? So the key takeaway over here is that if I give you the wrong information, which is based on the population average, you will make a worse decision than I provide you personalized information. Okay, so what we do really over here is to give you a better input. You still need to make the decision by yourself. That's it. Right, go ahead. Well, I have a question which may be different. Uh, maybe you said something about it. I missed it. Uh, it's not uh, the fact that uh, it's not just a matter of customized. It's very important. If uh, do you understand why? Moderna is better for me than Pfizer, and uh, Pfizer is better for you than uh, Moderna. It has a lot of consequences because uh, it means maybe maybe Moderna has some flaws, and then it's and then it's have terri terrific consequences for the company, right? Yes. So it's not innocuous at all. So is it possible to understand really the reason why it's this, this medication works for you better than it works for somebody else. Very good question. So actually, as many of you know, you know, the some of the vaccines have side effects. Actually, some people even die from one of the vaccines. I couldn't remember. Anyone knows? Uh, yeah, yeah, they can. They can. I mean, very small people. Yeah, right. can. So actually, uh, I think some research and all the newspaper says a certain age group, certain gender may be more likely to have side effects and die, right? Yes. Yeah, right. So, so actually over here, I, I need to admit, admit that I'm, I'm not a doctor, so I don't know the exact reason why some people are more likely to die from, you know, this kind of vaccines. But over here, by using my technique, it's possible to detect which group is more likely to die. And then based on my results, Scientists and doctors can investigate further to know why they're more likely to die. But without my technique, then you can just, you know, guess, for example, right? So that's why we only contribute part to the discussion. But if I study metaphysics, probably I can figure out further why people are more likely to die from some of the uh, vessels. <laughs> okay. Following the discussion, I think one. And uh, cost extension is uh, you can extend the approach you are doing uh, for like uh, failures. Now you are trying to evaluate a kind of a cost of treatment. Mm -hmm. but it's quite easy for to actually uh, tweak that uh, objective function a little bit and add like uh, failures and so on to, or social welfare. Nice. Yeah, but because of one hidden assumption or because of the last. Uh, medicine and also the allocation of uh, resources and now you pretty much assume it's uh, like a, a unlimited resource if you have uh, limited uh, uh, resources here let's say you only have uh, uh, 10 percent of a supply from a liner and the faster and uh, you know okay the effect can be different for different type of people then how to maximize that uh, the social value and make sure also the allocation is a failure uh, nice part nice part yeah thanks for bringing that Question. Yeah, I like to think that it's, I mean, it kind of is a trivial assumption, but I think that in the background you're assuming that there's no word of mouth, like the patients are not talking to one another. Right? We don't. We don't think that their suggestions they shouldn't be talking to one another. So to one of them, you're saying that I suggest I could use these two best options A and B, and then the other one B and C. So. So your assumption must be that they're not talking to one another. Uh, actually, we don't make assumptions in this case. So let me tell you the reason. So you are actually uh, emphasizing on the second step, the actual choice of which one you are going to visit. Suppose my friend recommends you visit this one, then I will probably more influence for what this provider, right? Yeah. 
But how do you make decision? You must have some inputs, right? One input is the recommendation from your friends. Another input will be from others, like our uh, study or US news. So over here, as I mentioned earlier, we are providing a more personalized information to, for you to make a better decisions. So if you consider your friends suggested, that's fine. That's one kind of input for you. But at least for this information input, we can provide a better input for you to make better decisions. Make sense? Kind of, I mean, yeah, I'm thinking that it kind of also depends on um, how fast the current information, the system status changes, exactly. or how much time do the patients have to think about it, right? Yes. Because the, the conditions change rapidly. If you were to make that decision for a specific person one hour later, maybe your suggestions will change. Yeah, yeah, it's, it can be dynamic. So, so uh, our results is based on a given data. Of course, when I have more data or more recent data, I can provide more reliable information. That's exactly a good point. Yes. So, uh, so you have patient information, but from the healthcare provider, what type of information do you have to do the? Maybe from the providers. From, from the provider, right? So, uh, at the end, you want to make suggestions, right? So, you have patient information, but what information do you have from the providers? It depends on what data I have. Typically, no. I just want to know. Right. <laughs> so, for example, I mean, uh, for for uh, for this study. Uh, we have the data from all the New York hospitals, but of course I can have access to Texas hospitals. Then I can provide information for Texas residents. For if I have data from Iran, then I can provide information for Iran populations. For example, uh, it really depends on what kind of data I can get. Um, um, so based on the characteristics of the data, data, right? Uh, uh, the characteristics. So fine, fine, fine. So. So, uh, so actually, right now, lots of data are public available. So the data is more than detailed than you can imagine. So, for example, normally we have the name of the providers, uh, the location, how many years they have to do, what the gender of the physicians, how many, where do they graduate from, and etc. You have lots of information. Actually, when I go through the talk, I will give you a more specific setting. Then I can you know, talk more about the, the providers. Actually, I haven't finished talking about my research yet. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you for the research questions. <laughs> so, yeah, sorry. Continue. Continue. Just half an hour. I think I'm a little bit over half an hour. So, so I just talked about half of my research. Sorry about that. Okay. So, most recently, during the pandemic period, I have spent quite some time for my COVID 19 policies. If you look back, these are some of the COVID 19 policies. Okay, so for example, stay at home order. Okay, it restricts residents from leaving their homes except for essential trips, right? So some people may say, oh, that's effective. Some people say not necessary, right? So I have two small also papers on this topic. And the first one studies the effectiveness of the orders in containing the pandemic. That is, how much does it reduce the number of infections? And the second one, uses mobile device data to understand the effect of these orders on the mobility of residents. Okay, so this one I'm looking at heterogeneous effect, and I find that for socially vulnerable population, they are more like they are less likely to follow the orders. So why? Because many of them are essential workers. They cannot walk from home. They need to go out. Okay, so that's the reason why this is what less effective for those socially uh, disadvantaged populations. Therefore, surgery suspension, okay? Uh, by the way, uh, on the, 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 the stay-at-home order, uh, now there's an article that says that the kids who stayed at home because of uh, isolation and quarantine or whatever in the United States that we went through, they are now very deficient in their communication skills. Yes, yes, I saw I saw a similar article. Yes, yeah, so this is you know now we're now now we are getting some of the effects of uh, 
long term isolation where people don't get to talk to each other and certain part of the brain doesn't get exercised. And so the kids born in this period do not get enough number of people talking to them. Uh, and, and, and that has a huge impact on on the development of the brain during the first few months of a baby. Even though they, we, we, they don't talk, they are observing everything. They're looking at their grandmother and uncle and other friends and somehow or the other they are recognizing a lot of things. And this is when the soft wiring becomes hardwired in their brain. And so there are a lot of issues of state of order that, was, that, that were not considered at the time because at the time it was more important not to get COVID. But now uh, people know more about it and perhaps next time when there's a pandemic of some sort, they may have to factor these things in. Yeah, thank you, Suresh, for putting that. If, if you actually help me to have one new idea, I should probably put one more idea over here. <laughs> the, the impact of COVID, a stand of home orders on children development, right? Is that it? So <laughs> thank you for mentioning the idea. Okay. By the way, the guru is presenting all this research. You probably got the idea that he doesn't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, continue. Okay. So surgery suspension, okay? So the, so as you know, for uh, during COVID period, some of the surgeries were suspended in order to save resources for uh, COVID patients, right? So so for I have you know two papers in this area as well. The first paper is uh, with Mimi uh, again. Uh, so for this one, we are looking at whether a transplant center should uh, suspend its organ transplants. So there are trade-offs, as you can see. If I don't suspend, then continue, you know, the patients will receive organ transplant, but there is a high risk of infection, right? So if I don't suspend, then, you know, but if I, if, if I don't suspend, you know, people will have infection. If I suspend, then patients on the waiting list are getting sicker because those patients are actually waiting for organ transplants. If they don't insert the problem, they can see it. So there is a trade-off, right? So what we do over here is we have kind of personalized recommendations based on the conditions of patients, based on the conditions of the providers, you know, to recommend whether they should suspend or not. So this is uh, published at uh, p -Wain. And then uh, this is another paper which is under review at, at management science. It's talking about spill over effect of suspending non-essential surgery. Okay, so by saying non-essential, it's something like elective. Okay, uh, you can you know book an appointment, something like like hip and knee replacement. So this is like non-essential. Okay, so the main purpose is okay. This one I can postpone. Not, uh, 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 is kidney transplantation non-essential? Uh, I thought the dental work is non-essential and I did not do dental work during the pandemic. So kidney, what's your guess? Is it essential? You said non-essential? Is, is that non-essential? Here, here you, you, yeah, yeah, thank you for, for letting me clarify that. So, oh, you mean you can wait and it does not, does not affect you? Is that what you're saying? As long as you're on a dialysis machine? I was actually about to clarify that, but, but okay. that, so so the policy is suspending non-essential, but as Suresh properly pointed out, kidney is essential. Okay, so that's why we say spill over effect. Okay, so the target is not essential. It's not essential. Okay, but then the it might affect some of the essential surgery like kidney transplant. The reason is think about hospitals. If you don't let me do my non-essential surgery. Yeah, I lose revenue, right? Lots of revenue. I cannot do non-essential surgery. What do they do? Give me notes. What do they do? Oh, 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 okay, I got it. It's a spillover effect that you're yeah, talking about. I got it. Effect. So I'm going to lay off some of my medical staff, right? If I lay off my medical staff, it will affect my essential surgery, like kidney transplant. So that's the, the key message of this paper. So, yeah, yeah, I understand. But like, if you think about the dental first day, it's probably not that important, right? Dental is also important. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I mean, it is considered non-essential in many cases, uh, cleaning and whatever. Uh, they can wait for a while. The question is, what is the spillover effect of 
suspending non-essential dental uh, stuff. Yeah, I understand. What I'm saying, dental is important uh, because, you know, Everyone like our teeth, right? So, so what I'm saying is, that if you study dental, then you don't you don't have spill over effect. If if you submit to management science dental, that's obvious, right? Because dental is not essential. Then you want to spend non essential. No, but what is what would be the spillover effect? Because they don't do kidney transplantation regardless. <laughs> <laughs> the, actually, uh, it's not it's not really, they, they are not really doing kidney transplant regardless. So what we do over here is that we can hear. Uh, a group of states with a policy with another group of states that don't have such a policy, then we have a clear diff in diff comparison to see what's the impact. It's not, you know, uh, purely due to COVID. So we actually factor in COVID as a control variable. Then we, our focus is control uh, the COVID and other policies by comparing those with the policy and those without the policy. Okay. So we are basically focusing on the cause of effects. Okay. Just finally, so I will present this paper later, but I want to mention that I have another paper with Su Jing also. A TI team is a faculty at our marketing group over here, assistant professor as well. And uh, for this one, we are looking at the quality, okay? Does telehealth reduce prescription errors? Because one of the major concerns for telehealth is that it may not provide good quality as in person visits. So this is what this paper is about. And finally, I have another paper on vaccination. Okay, so this is a joint work with Huai Yang Zhong, and uh, he will join Virginia Tech as a faculty, and the team on that as well. So we are looking at the impact of vaccination on the demand for public transportation. Okay, so this is very useful for the, for policymakers, especially for transport planners. So they will know, you know, as vaccine process goes on, you know, what's the demand for public transportation. I know some of you may think, oh, COVID is over, vaccine is over. Okay, so why do we have this? But remember, there are still many other countries that you know don't have enough vaccines yet. And in the future, there may be another pandemic, right? So you so that's why we are still uh, working on this. Okay, any questions about this? I know we had lots of questions. I, I have a question. Oh, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. No, I don't have a question. Go ahead. Oh, you don't want to ask? No, no, I was uh, uh, I was thinking about testing for COVID, and that has a huge impact on a lot of other things. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Actually, Kino, Kino has a few paper on COVID testing and how to allocate uh, COVID vaccines. I think that's an interesting topic. Especially right now when they realize that uh, that uh, the Chinese people have tested about trillions of tests during the last two years and the amount of carbon for each test is about 0.6 kilogram that includes the test and the transportation and all of that stuff and so the the huge amount of contribution to the to the to the greenhouse gases were contributed by the trillions of Trillions of uh, tests that were given in China and, that, and still continue to be given. So the effect on environment for testing has been serious if you do that large scale testing. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Yeah, so so hopefully next time when I present, I can have something on yeah, there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so question. I hope they have a 25 hours in the day. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, 
16 years, 20, 22, or from this point on forward? Oh, I'm so glad that you mentioned about the data. I, I actually share the same thing as you do for supply chain. The data is really difficult to get. So uh, we spent quite some time to get the data, and there are various ways. So I, I, I don't think any part is easy. So for some of them, as you can see, uh, we get the data from, well, you're only talking about this, or? No, in general. In general, right? Yeah, so sure, sure. So for example, for some of our papers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, for some of the papers, so for example, as I mentioned, we have a medical collaborator, so they gave the data to us, okay, but of course they don't give it to you for free, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> you need to produce some papers with them. So uh, this data is from the uh, medical collaborator, and uh, this data, oh, this data is publicly available, okay? So because we have organ transplant data, you do need to submit a proposal uh, to the UNOS which is for the organ transplant data. But uh, then the uh, transportation data is publicly available in terms of the number of flights from which city to which city, at what time, at what volume. So this is available. And uh, then uh, this data we purchased from HCAP. I mean, you know, uh, and uh, where, well, how about the others? So this data, this data are some of them are really difficult to get, or these data are publicly available as well. So, but remember, when you have public available data, then many people are you know using them. So there is a risk of you know doing similar things. So that's why I, I wrote these papers very quickly. Uh, <laughs> then, <laughs> then how about others? So which which particular one in mind? No, I was just, I was asking in general. In general, I would say very difficult to get. Uh, it takes lots of time and effort, and also networking, social, you know. <laughs> so Erica will know that. <laughs> it's a very difficult Yeah, I think, for example, the pandemic, the data is still developing. So it's yeah, still really developing, but we are lucky. Uh, so for some of them, uh, we submit proposals. And for the others, I kind of will uh, Block away uh, our kind of collaborators, and uh, for the others, I still have my connection in Michigan, so I I have lots of data from them as well. But I need to do some kind of remote connection. I don't have the data on my computer. I would say you know, uh, getting data is a real challenge in doing important research, as you mentioned. No matter whether it's supply chain or healthcare. What? How do these hospitals? Don't they want to improve? Why are they so stingy on their data? Are they not? <laughs> so same, we, same. Supply chain companies is also stingy, right? But they have their own research group. I mean, do they, they, care, they also have their own research group. Operation management. Research group. <laughs> so I'm kidding. So, so I mean, think about this. Who want to dig the data and prepare for you if there's no benefit, right? And also, someone else just mentioned healthcare data is very sensitive, right? So if I give data to you, then what will happen if I have some trouble? But it's actually even more difficult to get for healthcare data. Okay, so you know, hospitals, although some of them are non-profit, but they are not like a, a charity. You can get any data you want. Yeah, maybe I can add a comment on sure, that. Sure, sure. First of all, there are you will be surprised that there are tons of uh, healthcare data publicly available. So many of the data he mentioned are right here, the uh, checkups, the hymns, and so on. So those data are publicly available, but they can uh, be identified as some patient level information. And for the data you were asking earlier, actually, uh, there's a state, so Suji is also one of my co-author. So uh, you just need to subscribe to the data fossil fraud manually. They tell you every single patient and uh, what a treatment they receive. They literally don't tell you which patient uh, with their identity, but uh, you have the data on what a treatment they receive. Uh, where a lot of the uh, uh, use of telehealth on that uh, episode of treatment and uh, what's the outcome and so on. Uh, so uh, a lot of data is out there and it's free. Uh, we just need to subscribe to it. Uh, and for that uh, example you were talking about, so I had a personal experience. So I had uh, actually one, never published the research paper. So I got data from UT Southwestern and uh, we found out that they actually they are gaming the system uh, in Obamacare. They have a, a regulation that says, uh, okay, you need to, for example, uh, uh, there's one policy called the re-admission. So you need to do a, a, a basically improve uh, the efficiency. 
uh, 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 reducing uh, the daily emission rate. But we found they are gaming the system. For example, they will okay uh, push it at the patient. If you come on the train another day, come back. Okay, I gave you some treatment. If you have a uh, uh, like a, um, a COPD and so on. Then if you come back on the another day, I will admit you in the uh, in, in the uh, uh, emergency room, not be in the hospital as inpatient because the data will come to me uh, towards my admission rate. So we talked to them. Uh, they said oh, yes, that's common practice. But they said uh, then you will not be able to publish that data. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so yes, there's some. Yeah, you, are, you are saying they are stingy, but there is some motivation. They do, there are some things that they don't want you to find out. <laughs> so also, <laughs> yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's a valid point. <laughs> so it's not just the economic reasons, stingy or not. And not everybody is doing things that they should be doing. All right, so finally we can start today's talk. Okay, so, so sorry, how much time do I have until? You got enough time, don't worry. Oh. I mean, you can go until 3.30, even until 4, because we don't have the 30 minute uh, time with the students. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, but actually I enjoy, uh, you know, answering the questions, so that's why I think. No, no, I think that it's a, it's a good uh, session, uh, but I don't, I'm wondering why the students uh, don't ask these many uh, questions and have that much reaction uh, and, and, and interaction with outside speakers. Maybe they are so familiar with you, they don't mind bothering you. <laughs> but I think they should have the same kind of interest and interaction when we have outside speakers because we get more by 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 interaction and asking questions because you can always read the paper, right? So it's better to have more than paper that you can get by by this kind of questioning. So so let it be a you know I, I'm I'm sorry that many of the students are not here, but this would have been a good good place for them to be. Yeah, thank you, Sarish. I appreciate it. So okay, so this paper is essentially about the impact of telehealth on urban rural disparity. So let me uh, first give you some background information about the disparity in the US. And as you can see, these are some data uh, from CDC and the Commonwealth. You can see that in terms of poverty rate, it is around 70% in the rural area, but around 40% in the urban area. But in terms of the older populations, those older than 65, you can see that it's around 80% in the rural area, but around 40% in the urban area. Right. If you look at health status, you can see that rural populations are more likely to die from some of the living diseases, such as cancer, stroke, etc. Okay, and also in particular, children in rural areas with uh, developmental, or mental, or physical issues, they are more likely to face challenges in the rural areas. Yeah, good. Well, I can relate that. I come from a rural area in India, and uh, and actually, uh, my mother died exactly for the same reason. She had a urinary infection, which was not treated by the do local doctors because they did not know how to do it. And they gave her, uh, a, uh, they gave, they thought she had a malaria and they gave her quinine and actually she died because of that. It was unfortunate, but that can happen in the rural areas oh, many, many years ago. But just want to tell you that that is definitely a case and, and the poverty rate and the percent of the population about 65, I can relate to all of that uh, growing up in a, in, a, in, a, in a small rural area in India. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you for mentioning it. I, actually, I was also from the rural area of China. So my I, my grandfather also died from carcinoma because he's too old. No one wants to treat him. So I think I can also relate to you know some of the bitter stories. Uh, then in terms of the uh, kind of health care access, you know, some data over here as well. You can see that around 20 percent of the population live in the rural area of the U.S but only less than 10% of the physicians practice in the rural areas, okay? And in terms of transportation, surprisingly, around 40% of the rural areas do not have public transportation. And on average, if you live in the rural area, you need to travel around 10 miles to the nearest hospital, but for a person living in the urban area, he or she just need to travel on average five miles, okay? So the main takeaway from these two slides or that first 
rural areas, they are uh, thicker, older, and, and poorer. Okay. Uh, at the same time, they have fewer conditions. They need to travel a longer distance to the nearest providers. Okay, that's a main takeaway. And of course, the government, the US government, is well aware of such a disparity. And they have tried many things to reduce the disparity. Okay, so one such initiative they have is telehealth. So, anyone of you used telehealth before? Okay, quite a few of you. That makes my uh, presentation easier. Okay, telehealth basically refers to the remote delivery of healthcare services or information via telecommunication technologies. So, the key word over here is remote because physicians and patients are at different locations. Okay, just like Suresh and I are at different locations. Okay, so this is remote. Uh, this happened also during the pandemic, even in the cities. Yes. Yeah, I I was uh, I had a knee um, injury of some sort, and I wasn't going to go to the doctor, so I did all my knee uh, uh, physiotherapy with the, with the doctor on the screen, telling me how to do it and and repeat. Yes, very good, very good. So we have yeah, another. That's a, that's a telehealth as far as I can consider that. Yes, 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 yes exactly. Telehealth. So, what are some of the advantages of telehealth? You can see that first, it eliminates or reduces transportation barriers. So, you don't need to worry about public transportation. Second, it allows you to see more doctors. So, previously, you probably just go to see the nearest provider. And now, because of telehealth, you don't need to worry about distance. You don't need to worry about transportation. You can probably see many more doctors that are further away. Okay, advantages. So, however, uh, despite those advantages, the use of telehealth is minimum before the COVID-19 period. Mainly due to, you know, cultural issues, reimbursement issues, or uh, some other issues say regulatory issues, okay? So it, it is not often used before the pandemic. But many of these issues were eliminated during the COVID-19 period when insurance companies such as CMS expanded the telehealth. Okay, actually not the CMS, but almost all insurance companies expanded the telehealth during the pandemic period. And here are some of the highlights about the expansion. Okay, so for example, in the past, telehealth was paid at a lower rate in, in person visits or even not paid at all. Okay, but with the expansion, telehealth are paid at the same rates as in person visits. In the past, only a select number of providers are allowed to provide telehealth. But with this expansion, almost all physicians. Can provide telehealth. Actually, not only physicians, but nurses, social workers, they can provide telehealth. Question. But how do they integrate uh, chronic diseases where uh, doctor need to see the patient uh, in person? Good question. Cancer, they need to do a uh, biopsy of the tumor to see what is the uh, existing condition. They Very good question. That doesn't work well. That, that's actually a very good question. So note that not all diseases can be treated by telehealth, as you just mentioned. You know, if I want to have some biopsy, it's not possible. Okay. So over here, for the expansion for telehealth, they are primarily focused on those can be used by telehealth. For example, as Sarah mentioned, chronic diseases, pain management. Uh, Physical therapy, mental health. So these are more suitable for telehealth. Okay. And in the past, only selected areas can use telehealth. Now, pretty everywhere, you know, any geographic area can receive telehealth. Also, in the past, uh, patients can receive telehealth at designated locations, such as hospital or community centers. But with the expansion, Patients can even receive telehealth at their homes. Right? Also, over here, 
in the past only established patients, meaning that you already you know, know the physician and you can use the house. And now even new patients can use the house. Question. Is there any study uh, comparing the effectiveness of telehealth visits, televisits with in person visits? How whether the treatments are as effective or not? Very good. So uh, to answer your questions, first, we do have a paper with Su Jin Shun and uh, T.I. Kim that is comparing uh, telehealth visits and in-person visits in terms of prescription errors. Okay, so we do have a paper on that. And uh, for this paper, if I have time, I can briefly talk about that. You know, we can compare the outcomes for those going to telehealth versus those going to in-person visits. That's a good question. Any other questions? No, good. Okay, so with these expansions, not surprisingly, you know, the use of telehealth increased dramatically, right? But this is not the focus of my study. The focus of my study is to analyze whether telehealth reduces the gap between rural and urban areas. Some of you may say, yes, it will, because Rural areas don't have good public transportation, and telehealth helps me eliminate the barrier to so your health. Some of you may say, no, because telehealth requires technology, right? So if my rural area does not have good internet, they will not help me to reduce the gap, right? So as you can see, it's not a trivial question, okay? So here are our research questions. First, does telehealth reduce the disparity in terms of the overall visits? I say overall visits, I mean the sum of in-person and telehealth visits. So this is what we call overall assets. Okay. Second question: How does telehealth change physician, uh, change the patient's choice of visiting modality? Is it that some of the patients are going to switch from in person to telehealth? Or is that in person remain the same, but there are some more patients who are going to use telehealth? Okay, so this is my uh, second research question. Then the third research question, which are very uh, interesting to policymakers what are some of the barriers that prevent patients and the providers from using telehealth? Um. The corollary of the last question would be uh, if there are barriers, obviously telehealth would not be very successful because you cannot do certain things. But 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 regardless, if you have no choice and if you are in a rural area, uh, you will go for telehealth regardless. And the question then is, what is the quality of what is the, the deterioration in the quality of healthcare? Doing healthcare, tele telehealth healthcare versus in person, when in person obviously gives you better results. So what is what is the loss in quality when you have to do it in spite of the barriers? Yeah. So yeah, that, that's a good question. I think uh, what you are saying is that given the barriers I have, what can we do, right? Yeah, you still have no choice. You still have to go through whatever you have to go through and you have to do telehealth regardless. And in, in some case, people died, but they had no other choice. But all I'm saying is that there is some loss in quality because of that. But is that loss in quality is not too much that you still benefit from this in some sense? And that's sort of a question that is not. It's a corollary of the last question, but you you are not looking at this, I suppose, at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, yeah you're right. And for the second question, do you observe uh, uh, kind of the follow up? Uh, uh, what happens after they choose uh, telehealth versus not? Yes, yes. So, like, uh, did they for some uh, go to the inpatient setting or outpatient or uh, are there surgery procedures performed on the patient and so on? Very, very good. So, so we do have some of the data, as you said, what is, you know, the follow-up visits, 
Yeah. And actually, that's one of the uh, medical outcomes we are doing compared in person versus uh, telehealth. Uh, there's more likely to be read at the meter or not, for example. And uh, this is one we are going to look at. And for the uh, surgery, we still need to look at you know what kind of surgery they are going to have because over here uh, we are having the kind of uh, other patient we don't have you know some of the surgery data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think that will be an interesting angle to look at. Yeah, because one of the effects of telehealth is the so called gateway effect. So uh, they use it to kind of to screen you out. Uh, so okay, they're using telehealth. They say, hey, you need to do this and that. Okay, then go through like inpatient procedures. Some yes. of the will say. Uh, that's easy, okay, then they can make a diagnosis of right? okay. Yes, yes. So it actually depends on what kind of patients that some of the patients uh, may just uh, can be treated by telehealth. The others, as you say, may be more for kind of diagnostic screening purpose. Yeah. And uh, uh, although I didn't mention over here, but if I have time, I can do that. We look at different kind of diseases. So for example, some of them are kind of preventive. Mm. Some of them are kind of treatment. And we also look at COVID patients, non-COVID patients, and attention. So the effects can be different, as you correctly mentioned. Yeah. For curiosity, I mean, if you think of teleservice in general, because this is increasing everywhere, teleservices, so you don't you don't talk to me. Then you get robot in front of you. You don't get you get a menu, you get a menu, and you don't get it's very rare now that you get somebody. It's impossible, yeah. For any kind of uh, service, mm -hmm. you you uh, you want an internet for any kind of thing. Then you get a menu. After the menu, you get uh, and you never get somebody, right? Mm -hmm. uh, after all, there is a risk also that this is a curse in uh, security in in, in, in health. In health, right? Now. After all, the, the guy in front of you is asking questions. That, uh, that the robot will be able to ask the same, right? Yes. And then uh, you answer the question, and at the end of the day, you say, okay, because of this, no answers, and you get this prescription. So, is there a risk that this trend, which is very, uh, very uh, frustrating that trend, because you don't get really the service that you want? Uh, occurs in the healthcare. Uh, is it? Do we see? Do we see some signs of this general direction also in healthcare? So, or is there is no risk? So let me clarify. So are you talking about the privacy data security? No, no, no. It's just the fact. The convenience. I mean, if you the, the doctor is not in front of you. Okay. Yes. So you, can you, the doc, you can see the doctor. You can see the doctor. You see. You see. But he is not uh, touching you. I'm not okay. touching you. He's not touching you. So he yes, asks question. Uh, yeah. He asks questions, yeah. uh, and you answer. So you mean the doctor may cheat you? No, it may be immediately replaced by a robot. Oh, place on uh, uh, robbers. Okay, robbers. Yeah, exactly what happens in any oh, kind of robbers. teleservice. I right see. now, any time of teleservice, you want yeah. something, we ask questions, yeah. you answer a menu, after the menu, over there, and that's it. And you never see anybody. I see a point. And uh, these, are, after all, it's possible also in uh, healthcare. Yes. Is, is, is there a risk that we get this type of trend? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, it, it may be possible, you know. Actually, not only to telehealth, like when we are, you know, having online meetings, delivering classes, some people may jump in, right? <laughs> or some people may steal the data. So that's a valid concern. I think that, I mean, for the policymakers, they need to take this one into account for sure. Otherwise, there is a leakage of data, you know, drop the kind of you know, people still again. I agree, that's a good point. Uh, to follow up on Alain's uh, discussion here, uh, uh, I was wondering whether whether when you do when you when you introduce telehealth, uh, do you um, do you think there is a larger chance of uh, uh, having an AI expert taking all your questions uh, and for diagnosis instead of the actually the doctor is asking face to face? On 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 a Teams or Zoom or whatever, is there there is some discussion that of that kind? Uh, 
I, but the AI is also coming into AI is also coming into medicine, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I, I think you're right. I mean, lots of people are looking at AI, but you are looking at the benefit of AI, whereas Anna is looking at the risk of AI. Yes. Still in the data. So I think no, but my, my, my question was: Is AI going to be more common in a telehealth care than in in person visit with a doctor? There's a way. I mean, to continue this, the doctor himself can have a robot to help him. And at the end of the day, the robot takes over more or less. Yeah. So, and and they're because it, it increases the number of patients that they, they can, uh, they can uh, talk to. Yeah. So, but, but, but here's my take. When you get this robot to answer, you have answered this question, the doctors never sees them, more or less never. They spend like two seconds on it before they see you in person. When I when I see the doctor, I I'm not sure that they read every every question that I have answered. Yeah. So I mean, I have a question here. Anyway. Yeah, I mean the question that I would ask maybe considered with among uh, item three in mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whose perspective you're taking into account when you say barriers, but. I think that one of the important stakeholders here is the insurance companies. Yes. So when you say the telehealth, and I'm just assuming that whatever data that is available so far belongs to US. But if I'm a person living in the United States, I will find it really cheap to get that service from another country. Yeah. So first, my first point is that kind of information is not going to be registered. It's not going to be available to you as research makers in the uh, United States. The second thing is um, insurance companies wouldn't want that, right? So if I'm a person who doesn't want to pay insurance companies, then I can, now I'm eligible for health services from a different country, which is much more cheaper, mm -hmm. right? So I think that there, there are several issues from the insurance company's perspective as well. Yep. So if you're a policy maker, then you have to you have to think about that as well as the government. Also, the other thing is during the pandemic, maybe it has become an available information to you, but um, I think that this is a Texas law. I don't know what other state's law is, but uh, there was a point in time that they were serving, I mean, you, you were able to make a tele, telehealth appointment with, with a service provider in a different state. Exactly. But then at some point on, they said you cannot. Yes. You cannot. Yes. Yeah, that, that's, for example, something, um, something that the policymaker has to decide as well. Yeah, that, that, that's a great question, you know. Actually, not for the house. I mean, even for the other kind of in-person visits at different providers, Insurance is also a big influencer. Okay, so that's a valid point. And also, that's why you know before the pandemic, not many people are using telehealth. The reason, as you said, is because insurance do not reimburse them. Yeah, of course, as you said, this is a good. I mean, this is an important parameter. All right. So to address these questions, now I will talk about the data. Can I your question? Second research point. I have a question. So <clears throat> during COVID especially, how do you know from the data a patient is forced to visit to a telehealth car if it's his choice? Right? Because sometimes there are certain clinics which are not allowing patients to uh, visit yes. in person. So how it's hard to how is it hard to estimate the yeah. choice? Yes, very good question. So so I'm going to explain this one in more details as I go through the class I mean, through my answers. So please wait for a while, but if you still have questions later, sure. uh, feel free to let me know. Uh, just one thing. Uh, so one of the benefits of telehealth is getting second opinions is much easier. I think you could also include that, right? Because medicine is all about diagnosis, right? So you go to one doctor, he has one diagnosis, maybe another one has another diagnosis, yes. right? So yes. through telehealth, you could more easily compare different diagnoses, right? Yes, exactly. you, can, you can visit more doctors with the client. So the data, okay, as I mentioned, I will talk about data in this specific context. So the data is from one of the largest uh, insurance companies in the US, okay? So this payer or insurance company has around 100 million customers across different states in the US. 
and it expanded the telehealth in March 2020, which is around the same time as CMS. Okay, and uh, our study period is from October 2019 to September 2020. So you can see that we have roughly uh, five months before the expansion and a six months after the expansion. Okay, and uh, during our study period, we have around 10 million observations. You can see the data are very large. Okay, so over here, our data are granular on each minute. So it's at data level, we, as Gary mentioned, we have physician patient identifiers, not their real names, but uh, identifiers. So we will know which patient, visit which physician, or which that. We have here demographic information, we have diagnosis codes, procedure code, so we will know what kind of disease, what kind of procedure the patient has entered. But how can we know whether a visit is telehealth or in person? So luckily, we have these modifiers that allow us to differentiate telehealth from in-person visits. Okay, so because our data are big, so we aggregate the data uh, at the provider math level. Okay, so these are the summary statistics aggregated by provider map. As you can see, we have the information over here about patients. So before and up, you can see that the statistics are quite similar. But if you come here, urban and rural areas, okay, as you can guess, you know, rural areas are older, they have a higher proportion of older patients. Okay. And for from the provider perspective, you can see that urban area have more experienced physicians. By, by the way, by saying tenure, I mean the number of years the physician has practiced. And also, in the urban area, they have more, uh, have a higher proportion of individual practitioners versus uh, organizational practitioners. Okay, so here are some of the uh, summary stats. Okay, by the way, as I mentioned, we aggregate at the provider math level. So if a provider is in the urban, then we designate that as an urban provider. So, so, so we want whether the, the rural patients can get access to urban doctors, right? So because it's in the house. That's right, exactly. So in this case, how you count? You count like uh, the doctors as a, based on their location, right? Like, yes. Count it as rural or count it as urban? That's a great question. So there are two ways to aggregate the data. So over here, I aggregate uh, by a provider in a month. If a provider is in the urban area, then I treat all the patients and in the urban area. Okay, so that's more like a proxy. It's a, it's a kind of relatively good proxy, but because around 90% of the urban providers' patients are from the urban area. Okay, and then as an additional analysis, we are going to aggregate the data by county and mass. So if a patient is in the urban county, then that's urban. Of course, as you, you mentioned, for urban providers, I may have some rural patients. So later I'm going to dive deeper into that to see which one drives my results. That's a great question. Especially like if because I work from home, some of the people that used to work in the urban, they, they actually hide themselves in the rural area. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So that's why I still have connections with the doctors in the urban area. Yes, yes. So that's why we are going to dive deeper to see what is happening behind. I also have another question about the patient visit. What yes. if uh, it is for the same disease, for the same patient, they need to see him twice, for example, I first see you, uh, through the house, yeah, and then that decide, the doctor decided, hey, this is not enough. I need you to come to my office. So, something like this, like those visits, right? Those visits are they independent or, or I don't know about the data, or or they're related? And that that's a great question. So, uh, because it's, I mean, if we want to test them out, it's possible to see you know, whether the subsequent visits are related to the primary one. Uh, but in this study, we didn't do that, um, uh, partly because we have some kind of, uh, you know, uh, computational power issues. 
But in this one, we simply count the number of in-person visits or the number of telehealth visits and aggregate them by provider demand. Yeah, but that's a great question. I have a couple of questions with your data. Yep, sure. Um, yeah. yeah, so go, go, so the first, that's, uh, can you show me the data? Show you the data? No, I mean the, 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 the statistic that you, you displayed. Oh, okay. Yeah, so one was uh, uh, that the, the mean age is, doesn't, is not that different. You know, you would have expected it to be much more yeah, different yeah. Than, than what you see here. Yes. Um, so that's one question. And go to the second page. Sure. The second page, you have the mean here, which are similar to before expansion. After this is by definition, or or by by uh, by uh, observation, because to to have exactly the same number is almost zero probability. If you yeah. do my observation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so these two are great questions. So let me explain to you why. So the first one, as you see over here, is quite small. Uh, but I mentioned earlier, the gap should be much larger. And the reason is that over here, we are looking at a private insurance company. OK, um, so there are younger populations. OK, but if you look at uh, uh, Medicare, then you may see a different story, for example. The second question, so why do they look the same with you know, differences, zero probability? The reason is that we are looking at a panel data. So uh, the same provider across different methods. So it's by definition, they're the same. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to clarify on this. Okay, so to answer the first question, okay, so we start by, you know, blocking some diagrams. So over here, as you can see, the horizontal axis indicates math, as I mentioned to you earlier, March is the treatment time marks, right? And I have five months before and a six months out, right? And the vertical axis is the total number of minutes, as I mentioned to you, the sum of in-person and telehealth minutes. And note that I have log transforming, okay? And then the solid line over here is the treatment, urban area. The dotted line is the control, rural area. So for both before and after treatment, you can see that the number, the total number of visits in the urban area is higher than rural areas. But if you look at the gap, you can see the gap is quite small before the treatment, but quite large after the treatment, which suggests that the expansion actually increases the gap between the urban and rural areas. I can also do some parametric, non parametric difference in difference model. And in the first step, I look at the difference between urban and rural areas. So, for example, I, I take the difference between these two, I get this difference between these two, get this. So, this is first difference. Okay. Now I have second difference, which is the difference between these two numbers, I get this. So, that's why this is difference in difference. So, it's positive, it means that the expansion increases the gap which is consistent with my uh, results from the figure. But of course, some of you may say, oh, you haven't control for uh, the systemic, systematic differences across states. You haven't control for time change. You haven't control for COVID. You haven't control for COVID policies. So that's why we need a econometric model. Okay. By the way, this is the only equation I have for my presentation. <laughs> So the y variable over here is the log transform total minutes. It's a dummy variable that equals to one if a provider is in the other area. And time expansion is another dummy that is equal to one if it is after the expansion. Then x is a control variable that includes COVID cases, includes different COVID policies. Then I have my step fixed effect. I have my year math fixed effect. Okay, so this is my uh, econometric model, a typical or non-typical difference in difference model. Okay, I say non-typical, the reason is that uh, normally when I analyze heterogeneous effect, I use triple difference. 
But in my case over here, I don't have a state that don't expand to the end. That's why I cannot use triple difference. I use this non-typical difference in difference. So, so the one question, what's included in your provider? Uh, uh, does it have to be a hospital or individual, uh, like a small clinic and uh, individual physician? Individual physician? Yes. Like, okay. Yes. So because we aggregate the data by physician, mm -hmm. so we have physician uh, fixing that. Okay. But do you look at the affiliation? Why some of this, uh, this uh, physician is affiliated with a, a big hospital or just a, it's a kind of a small clinic? Right. Yeah. Answer that because uh, for example, right after COVID nineteen, I think a lot of the small clinics uh, they, they shut it down for a few months, but the uh, big hospitals they are still right. Is that a kind of factor? Yeah. So in the main analysis, we did that, but as additional analysis, we look at the heterogeneous effect. Uh, individual providers versus organizational providers. We do have that analysis in the paper. So, uh, yeah, so that, that's an interaction tip. There's only interaction tip, or you also have uh, individual effect over there? Uh, uh, that's that's observed by you know, absorbed by this provider. Oh, so, uh, math, math, this way. Individual math is oh, absorbed also. <laughs> so that's why I say it's not typical for channel. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? So when I explain regression model to my graduate student class, they always have lots of questions. They will ask me, how do you know y is equal to this? How do you derive this? <laughs> 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 but if you run a model over here, I have three different models. The first one, I don't control for anything, right? Uh, no COVID case, no state policy, but only the, the fixed effects. Then I get 0 0.049, which is similar to my non parametric difference in difference, and I got 0 0.05, right? But if I control for COVID cases, I get, you know, slightly smaller, but not so much different. 3.8%. And then over here I get 3.8%. Okay, because I my y is not transformed, so the coefficient over here can be interpreted as the expansion increases the disparity by 3.8%. So, so, so your y is total visit. Are you going to divide into telehealth visit versus in-person visits or these are what what exactly drive the difference or this is total visits, right? Yes, total yes. Most. That's that's a great question. Actually, it motivates me to answer the second question. So over here for the second question, I'm going to do two things to understand what's been happening behind, as you said. So what I'm going to do uh, first is that I'm going to look at only in-person visits first. Then I'm going to look at only telehealth visits. Okay, so to see you know what is happening behind. Okay. I'm also going to, as the same question you answered, I'm going to only look at, still look at urban and uh, rural provider, but I'm only going to look at urban patients for this step. This step, I'm only going to look at rural patients to see what is happening behind. Okay, so step number one, doing this. Step number two, doing this. Clear? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to look at uh, in-person visits for now. So still, you can see that this is here mass, this is in-person visits. So you can see that before the expansion, uh, the number of in-person visits is higher in the urban area. But after the expansion, it is actually lower in the urban area. Okay, which suggests that the expansion reduces the number of in-person visits in the urban area relative to the rural area. So if I my non-parametric difference in difference, you can see that this is negative, okay, which is consistent because my y variable is log transform. So this one can be understood as reduce the number of in-person visits in the urban area by 36%. So if I do my uh, regression analysis, you get the same results from the first model when you don't control for anything, that is around 36%. But if you control, they remain relatively the same. So for example, over here, if I control for all of them, it reduces the number of in-person visits 
in the public area by 32.3%. Okay, so this is technical evidence. So you can see that before expansion, they are almost the same. But after expansion, the gap is much larger. Okay, so over here is positive. It means that it increases the number of telehealth visits in the urban area by 43% relative to the rural area. Question. Question. So did this observation happen after the massive amount? So at that time, um, where do people before, vaccinate? Before, before, before. Because of the vaccine is starting in December and our study ends in September. So that's before. Yes, very good. Any other questions? Okay. Over here, if I run my regression model, you can print the same results. It increases the number of telehealth visits in the urban area by around 42%. Okay. So the question to Su uh, so the answer to Su Chan's question is that it actually reduced the number of in-person visits, but increased the number of telehealth visits in the urban areas. Then the second step, I'm going to look at only urban patients and only rural patients to see what is happening behind. So over here, you can see that in terms of total visits, if I look at only urban patients, the coefficient is positive. But if you look at only rural patients, it's negative. So recall that in our main model, the coefficient is positive. So it means that our main results is driven by the urban patients Okay, so I can also do the same analysis for in-person visits by breaking them down, and the telehealth visits breaking them down. So all the results are consistent in the sense that our main results are driven by urban uh, patients seeing the urban providers. Okay, so this yeah, is what's the surprising one is the a rural area and patients also reduce their number of telehealth visits. Yes. So what's the reason why that's happening? I would expect that both the areas that the telehealth visit should go up. I think one of the reasons may be uh, the urban providers, they are very occupied by urban patients. So as a result, they may not have enough capacity as before to take additional rural patients. Any other questions? All right, so over here are some of the uh, robustness checks and for this paper. And as you can see, they have quite a, a number of robust checks. And the first one is a pre and post treatment effect analysis. And for this one, we have two reasons for doing this. The first one is to analyze you know, whether we have pre-treatment uh, pre parallel trends. As you know, the parallel trends is a key assumption for difference in difference model. So that's why we have this. And then the second reason is we want to see whether the effect kind of changes over time, okay? So these are the two reasons. By the way, for each one of them, I do have details. I'm going to uh, briefly go through it because we have limited time, but if you are interested in any one of them, I will be happy to chat. Okay. Uh, the second one is in terms of alternative models. In the main analysis, if you recall, uh, we have a regression model where Y is log transform this. And over here, uh, because it's a counted data, so we use Poisson and negative binomial models as a robustness check, and the results are consistent. And also, our, uh, our data provider is an insurance company across different states and uh, in individual states there may be slight different kind of policies and that's why we have time very lo local shocks to accommodate differences across different states at different times and then uh, as some of you mentioned there may be some providers who never use telehealth so you may be wondering whether our results are driven by these providers we do exclude them as a robust check, and our results still remain the same. And this one related to Chan's question, you know, we also aggregate patients by county and amount. 
and we still obtain uh, similar results. And uh, this one, uh, classification of rural urban areas, okay, so some of you may say that, okay, so there are different ways to classify rural and urban patients. So we try many different alternative definitions and our results remain uh, robust. Then for this one, okay, some of you may say, oh, urban and rural uh, patients, they are different. So for example, uh, rural patients, they are older, they have fewer insurance. So what we do over here is that we select from treatment and control groups uh, a sample of counties that have similar characteristics. They have the same age, they have the same insurance coverage, they have the same kind of poverty level, et cetera, uh, to do the analysis and our results remain the same. Okay, and also we do the uh, propensity score matching as well, and we do the policy matching as well. And we also do a falsification test with a pseudo treatment type. Because some of you may think that that's probably uh, just due to uh, kind of, we will say, March effect. Okay, not really due to expansion. It just happened you expand in March, but maybe March itself, then there will be a gap. So, what we do is due to kind of falsification test, we uh, use the data from a prior year. And then the prior March has a pseudo treatment to see whether we still observe the same effect and we don't. We also try some other methods, so I just uh, kind of uh, suppose the treatment is in, say, January, or the treatment is in February. Of course, these are kind of pseudo treatments, and we don't observe effects. And then we also uh, do kind of leave state out analysis to see whether our results are driven by certain states. We do leave math out analysis to see whether our results are driven by certain maps. So our results remain consistent. Uh, that's a good question. Yes, that, that's a good question. It might be possible, you know, um, blue and red, they have different effects. That's a good idea. Thank you for mentioning that. But, but, uh, even in that case, very, um, I can imagine the urban tends to be more blue, rural tends to be more red, even in a blue yeah. state. So maybe the urban rural thing is already kind of factoring yeah, some, of the, some yeah. of the things. Right? Yeah, that's a great idea. I mean, we can, we can kind of you know, match them, you know, uh, say I match rural counties, one in blue, one in red. I also match urban counties, one in blue, one in red, to see whether there is any kind of color effects. Uh, do you have a some disconnecting between you know, what you do and uh, the question two is the discussion. Uh, your second uh, question is uh, the kind of uh, a patient's perspective, the patient's choice. Yes. Uh, and about your analysis, you are from providers, uh, your unit of analysis of providers, Yes. And, uh, and the mouth. You know? yes. So I wonder if you can do a robust to check uh, like using patient as the unit of analysis, looking at uh, like a visits, a number of visits, like the, for each patient in your mouth, and uh, before and after telehealth, and see uh, if uh, yeah, it's still consistent. Yeah, that's a great idea. And we have thought about that before. So the main reason is that some of the patients, we don't observe them across our study period. Mm. So for example, one patient, I only observe in January, then I don't have my panel data. Mm. That's why we did not do that. Yeah, yeah. Provider, yes, there might be some alternative uh, uh, explanations. So there's another way the patient choice that, okay, uh, you come, okay, uh, for uh, in person or telehealth. And some providers are, so I don't want to see any patient physically. So you have no choice that. If yes. you want to see me, uh, you have to go through telehealth. Okay? Yes. Some hospitals or providers and we, that might be more open. So, yes. so there's some disconnection between what you do and the, the story you are telling. Yes, yes. So actually I'm going to talk about you know uh, some of the choice model at the patient level mm -hmm. over here. So let me explain this one to see whether I can ask, uh, answer your question. Mm -hmm. So over here, what we do is that we first do analysis. So this is essentially a choice model. Uh, so it's a logic model whether it's telehealth or in-person visits. So we do the patient level analysis first. So these are some of the control variables. 
over here. So, uh, so over here, uh, you know, during our study period, if a given patient has used telehealth, then that's one. Okay. If it doesn't use, then that's zero. So what we observe is that, I mean, intuitively, rural patients are less likely to use. What we also observe is that older patients that are less likely to use, and also male patients they are less likely to use. So these are at the uh, patient level. And we do the same analysis uh, for individual providers. So for example, over here, we see that, uh, say, older providers, they are less likely to use. We also see that uh, organizational providers, they are less likely to use, probably because of the uh, requirements at different organizations. Okay, so to quickly sum up uh, what we have done in this study is that we find telehealth indeed increase the disparity uh, between rural and urban areas in terms of overall access. We also find that urban areas have a higher uptake of telehealth services and a substitute in-person visits with telehealth visits, whereas rural areas has much lower adoption of telehealth. And for the barriers, we find that uh, rural area senior uh, patients, male patients, they are less likely to use telehealth, uh, but uh, older providers and uh, organization affiliation providers, they are also less likely to use telehealth. And in the paper, I also have some additional analysis, as I mentioned to you before, but I, uh, due to time constraint, I'm going to only briefly go through it. But once again, if you want to know more details, I will be happy to share. Do you know the zip code of each patient? Only three digits. Only three digits. Uh, yes. uh, and uh, uh, so uh, you know providers uh, zip code. Yes. Right? yes. So it's very interesting to see that rural patients are seeking, uh, let's say, treatment from a way of and or vice versa and so on. Yes. 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 We do. We do have that kind of data. So what we observe is that for uh, urban providers. Around 90% of the patients are from urban. Mm -hmm. And for rural providers, around 70% are from the rural areas. Mm -hmm. yeah, so we can, we can, you know, do detailed analysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. So some of the additional analysis we do over here, uh, for one of them, as I mentioned, we do analysis uh, by comparing preventive versus non-preventive care. Okay, so preventive, you can think about it as say vaccine or diagnosis test, et cetera. We also look at primary care physicians versus specialist care to see you know, who is driving the results. We also look at the heterogeneity from provider perspective to see you know, whether younger providers are different from older providers. We also to want to see whether the providers can have a large practice skill uh, are different from those with a small practice skill. And then for the policies, I already talked about the barriers, uh, and we also look at the healthcare quality, as I mentioned earlier, we do have a look at the quality. And then for the uh, implications, we look at COVID visits versus no COVID visits. We also look at the counties with high risks versus the counties with low risks to see what is driving our results. Any questions? The quality or some measures to hmm? share with us some how to measure the quality, healthcare quality. Uh, healthcare care quality, there are actually many dimensions to measure the healthcare quality, but over here we are only looking at the seven day real admission or 30 day real admission. Okay. And there are many others like you said, you know, how about doing surgery to the patient. So are you able to quantify the quality of the provider the physician? The quality of the physician. Yeah, for example, by using you already have the health care quality measure. Yeah. Then you look at the the, the aggregated to the physician lab, then you can have some measure, or, or even you can look at the amount of use of the physician. Yeah. So, I see. I see. Are, what I'm thinking is, uh, let's just say if I'm a patient and anyhow, uh, uh, yeah, I'm going to go through like a telehealth. Mm -hmm. Then I want to at uh, least see the best. Uh, uh, physician, maybe 30, 50 miles away. Yes. If I do like an in person, probably I only want to, I'm willing to drive for five miles. So, uh, quality of a physician or provider may matter on. Yes. 
from when I decided to which to bring in mode which mode of this is our work. Yes, yes, yes. That will nicely link to some of my other research as well. That's a good point. Yes, I can compare the quality of different providers. Yeah. I have some uh, questions, um, Aguiwa. Sure. So one of the things that you found out, uh, the difference was like four miles for the for the urban people and the nearest hospital is 10 miles for the rural people. So if you factor in traffic and parking problems and all that, that difference may actually go in the favor of the rural people in some way. I would much rather drive 10 miles in a rural area than four miles and find a parking, which may spend more time finding one in a, in a city. Yeah. So that's one observation that I would make. The other one I would make is that uh, people, there may be more retired people in the rural area. And even if they are not retired, it seems to me that the people who are working in the rural area have a little bit of an easy go, lucky kind of lifestyle where the people in city are always busy and tense and they they put a lot of time value money on a time value in some sense and so they may say okay i i i lose i gain you know 30 minutes or one hour by going telehealth but that same one hour may be viewed differently by the city people versus the rural people yes yes, yes. so my own view is that Perhaps your results, uh, if, they, if you factor that into a, not just 4.5 miles, but the time and the parking and all that hassle factor that goes into the city, and the time value of money or, ta or, the, or the time value uh, in terms of difference of difference difference in the way there's the rural and the city people value their time may actually give you some more. Uh, more explanation for the results that you got. Yeah, thank you, sir. So that's great suggestions. And uh, yeah, I will definitely think about that. Are there other questions? Because if there are now other questions, I'd like to talk to you about the, the, the future, the next few dates of what's going on for this in the seminar. Sure, sure. So let, let me answer. There is a question from Gary. Yeah, yeah. So you ask questions first, and then I'll, I'll talk about that one. Okay, so I have a question regarding the primary care and the specialist. Sure. So you mentioned in the paper that um, although the main results, the gap is actually larger after the implementation, but actually the driving forces are actually the opposite for the primary care, that the gap for telehealthcare is reduced, but the uh, in-person uh, gap actually increases. But uh, in my intuition that um, uh, if I need to use a telehealth care, so probably I would use it for minor like an acne or a pain. Yeah. But if I need to do a like a major surgery, that is um, probably I need to go for a specialist. Yeah. Probably I won't go for a specialist. Right? Uh, won't go for a telehealth right? Yeah. So do you have more insights why the driving forces are the opposite for primary care? Uh, so we are still trying to figure out what's the exact reason behind. Okay. And uh, by saying specialist and the primary care, we are we are only looking at those you know uh, procedures that are suitable for telehealth. And uh, I would guess could it be specialists. I mean, people care more about specialists. So they are trying to you know <laughs> because primary care you know. Uh, as you said, it's more about minor issues, right? But if it's uh, a specialist, then yeah, I would want you to see the specialist. I really want you to see, even though it's far away or it's in another area, I want to use telehealth. So that's my kind of uh, conjecture. But uh, it's worth looking at that. Okay. Um, I have a question. Sure. So, uh, I'm not sure if it's a typo in the conclusion part of the paper. <laughs> so, and also I noticed you wrote that on the, um, on the slides. And you mentioned that in the talk that uh, the the um, for urban area there is a higher uptake for telehealth, right? Urban area, there is higher. In, yeah, that's right. Yeah, but then on your paper it says it's lower, so I guess it may be a typo. <laughs> and also you said that's that that's, um, <laughs> that's a benefit of presenting here <laughs> to the students. <laughs> yeah, there's just a sentence I can put that to you. 
Yeah, sure, sure. I, yeah. I can take a look. I just want to make sure that I understand you correctly. And also, um, you said that uh, the uh, the rural urban disparity and in person uh, visits in in person visits decrease, right? But then the uh, number of uh, in person visits for rural areas stays similar. So that means that the earth for the in person visits for um, for urban areas decrease, right? So and then the reason should be that the urban uh, <laughs> the urban areas patients switch from in person to telehealth, correct? No, urban they, they switch, right? Yeah, but like you said rural they switch. So I guess it's obvious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for mentioning that. I mean, uh, yeah, thank you for, for bringing that out. Yeah, we are currently revising the paper, so that's the uh, right time, you know, to correct the typos. <laughs> yeah. Any other question? Uh, no, I think it's your time to. You know. Okay, okay, so first of all, uh, let me uh, thank uh, Guiva for. Uh, very exciting um, uh, talk, as well as uh, giving us an uh, overview of his research. And I hope he didn't spend too much time and, and, and as a result wrote one less paper, but anyway, that's his problem. <laughs> uh, uh, so let's go and, and um, the next one is September 30. Uh, Divakar Gupta from UT Austin is going to give a talk here. And uh, it will be in person, and I'm not sure I will make hybrid at that time, but but let's let's just do that. For the time being, it'll be maybe fully in person. Uh, October 14, we are having informs present presenters give their talks for rehearsal. Uh, I would like to mention that people should give exactly the kind of talk they will give at informs. If you're giving a flash talk, then give a flash talk here so that we have a, you know, you give five minutes and maybe one minute question or whatever. So please do that so that you have a rehearsal and you can also modify your slides. Uh, um, you will have at least a day or two of time to, to do that. So please uh, work with Nina to schedule uh, your informs presentation talks on October 14. Uh, then October 21, I am trying to get an outside speaker, but if not, uh, if, if that doesn't happen, then Ashwin is going to be doing what uh, Guiva is doing today. He will be giving his, uh, his, uh, his research and his papers, uh, so that would be 21st, so I'm not completely uh, which one it will be. If, if Ashwin doesn't do it, we'll find Ashwin another day. Uh, October 28th and November 4, there are no talks because I will be in Japan on those both dates, both Fridays. Uh, November 11, is Anyan here? Anyan is not here. Oh, Anyan is not here. I think November 11, we are getting uh, uh, somebody from San Diego. Uh, and so that would be uh, November 11. And November 18, there is no talk because the DSIS in Houston. And uh, so we will all be going. Uh, on number eight, well, some of us are going, we're going to be the Houston. So that's sort of what I have now. And after that, I think it is depending on whether Ganesh uh, uh, got his uh, house in order in terms of recruiting. Well, it's not his problem. It is the university is taking a lot of time for all the bureaucracy. We do have two positions. We'll be recruiting. We'll be having a lot of interviews from outside candidates or candidates. And so after November 18, we are likely to have pretty much a lot of Fridays busy with the candidate interviews. And, and so that's sort of what we're looking uh, between now and, you know, mid-November, okay? Any questions regarding that? Okay, in that case, uh, thank you for uh, being here. And uh, once again, Guiva, thank you for... Uh, a long talk. I would have taken you out to dinner, but I'll, I'll next time I take the students out, you can join me. Sure, sure. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Suresh, for the opportunity. Okay. Then thank you, everybody. And thanks to Guiva. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye now. Bye bye.